Hello and welcome to the show. You're watching Tech24. I'm Julia Seeger. Fears for food security in East Africa are mounting as swarms of locusts gorge themselves on the country crops. This year's outbreak seems to be the worst in the last 70 years. We tell you how smartphone apps can help track real-time information to better understand their movements. And testing the potential of miniature cameras, scientists from the University of Washington in the U.S. have developed a tiny wireless camera that can ride on the back of a beetle. We speak to the research's co-lead author about why it's such a breakthrough. They resemble dark storm clouds and are a great threat to food security. Gigantic swarms of desert locusts often descend on the Horn of Africa. These grasshoppers can multiply to billions to then vanish all at once. On the ground, farmers are left watching in dismay as they ravage their fields. One of the main challenges facing those tackling infestation in Kenya, for instance, is collecting and sending real-time information. But a nap is now here to help. James Wilson has the story. In Kenya's Turkana County, the weather may be clear, but the sky is black with locusts. Feared since biblical times as harbingers of doom and misery, it has been 70 years since Kenya saw swarms as large as these. It, one locust eats and uh, food equals to its weight. So it remember having millions of locusts. Akilo is a locust scout. His training and job are funded by the United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization. Every day he treks through the bush, tracking and logging the plagues on a specially developed app called eLocusts. So I go look for locusts where they are, I report, I take pictures, I upload move, move, move videos of their movement. eLocusts was only launched this month and it sends technical teams data on both the size of the locusts as well as their location, allowing the team to make quicker, more informed decisions. Once you send the report through the locust application, uh, the report actually gets reflected in the system. And in case we want to get information about uh, the place and where you are sending these reports from, we can access them in the system and from there we can interpret and actually get them, interpret the data and also execute it. The team have two choices. They can either send a plane to deal with the swarm or a man wearing a protective suit to spray them with insecticide. But it's an uphill battle. Locusts can move up to 100 miles every day and are extremely quick to breed. This year's swarms have also been carried further by a record number of cyclones. For farmers in Turkana County, already the most impoverished of Kenya's regions, it all spells disaster. And the crisis extends well beyond East Africa's rural communities with the food supply of an estimated 25 million people now thought to be in jeopardy. And it's now time to welcome our in-house expert, Dan and Jake Hadokar. Hello, Dan. Hello, Julia. So now satellite imagery and supercomputers are also being used now to try to predict these paths of locusts. Well, yes, these two technologies work in tandem. Uh, as of now, satellite imagery is not able to detect uh, the movements of these locust swarms. But what it can do is that they can uh, provide estimates of rainfall, for example, or, or of uh, vegetation development, which allows the monitoring of uh, locust habitats. And when you feed this information and other re relevant information into a supercomputer, you are able to run these predicting models that are able to tell you uh, where is the likelihood of the emergence of these locust swarms. This is something that has been done in Kenya, and these models are also helpful in determining the impact of food and fodder production as a result of these uh, locust uh, swarms. And at the same time, they also act as early warning systems. Now, there's another insect that's creating a, a lot of chaos. It's the mosquito that's killing millions of people uh, every year. Researchers have come up with an innovation solution to try to reduce their population. Well, yes, mosquitoes are responsible for diseases such as malaria, for chikungunya, yellow fever, you name it. And there are so many of these deadly diseases. So now, of course, there are many uh, initiatives to control the population uh, of mosquitoes. And one such initiative uh, involves an international team of researchers uh, which are using or which have used drones and sterilization technique in order to curb the uh, population of mosquitoes. So this involves, as you can see in the, uh, in the picture here, this involves the use of a drone and a special cartridge in which uh, the male mosquitoes, they are grown up 
and they are sterilized by using radiation. And these sterilized mosquitoes, they are placed in uh, the cartridge at very low temperature. And um, using a drone, the cartridges are carried to the targeted area. The drone ascends to a certain uh, altitude, and then the mosquitoes are released. The idea being that these male mosquitoes will compete with other mosquitoes for food, and they will also be competing for uh, mating. But of course, they will not produce any offsprings. Well, thank you, Dan. And actually, while insects can become a nuisance, they're also proof, if needed, that nature displays the most powerful and beautiful innovations and that men still have much to learn. And here's a great example of so-called biomimicry. Researchers at the University of Washington were able to create a low-power, low-weight wireless camera system the size of a coin by mimicking the eyes of beetles. This is a breakthrough knowing how challenging it is to create vision for small robots. Well, to speak more about it, I'm joined by co-lead author and PhD student at the University of Washington, Vikram Iyer. Thank you for joining us. Hi, Julia. Yeah, it's great to, great to talk to you. So tell us more about your project. So, so we came up with this idea when we started thinking about just how much we use vision, uh, both as humans, and if you think about other animals as well, it's one of our most important senses. And if you think about some of the um, some of the robots, uh, like autonomous cars and drones, vision is also really important for these applications. But the problem is that when you try to shrink it down to a robot that's, say, about the size of a one-cent coin, uh, vision becomes really challenging because of the, the power, size, and weight requirements. Now, why was it such a challenge, more specifically? Yeah, so if you look at something like your, your phone, it also it has a pretty small camera, like the chip itself isn't very big, but the rest of the system around it, like the processor that you have in your phone, as well as the battery and all of those things, make it a lot larger. What lessons from nature have you learned in the process? Yeah, the, the way that we, we started thinking about miniaturizing this more was by looking at insects. And, and we saw that one thing that a lot of insects have is the same sort of problem where uh, they, they have these eyes that are um, sometimes like 10% or more of their, their body weight. And it also takes up a significant amount of their energy just to see. And what, what a lot of insects have adapted to do is they have specialized parts of their eyes that, um, that say have higher resolution or better uh, can see faster motion and things like that. Uh, so we took that same sort of approach and we, we built this really small and low power camera, but we mounted it on this actuator that can let the camera pan back and forth. And so that way we can get uh, a very or a much higher resolution uh, panorama image from this single low power camera. And now what are the main applications? Yeah, you, so you could think about using this for all kinds of applications. Um, a couple of things that we're excited about are just the fact that you can you can actually shrink down a vision system to use on small robots that can go into confined spaces like um, like a pipe or something else like that. Uh, we've also gotten a lot of interest from um, from from people studying biology uh, because this is a, a completely new tool that um, that we could use to say study insects or small birds and other animals um, that that you know we haven't had before. We could also think in the future of doing completely new things, like combining the best of what insects can do, uh, which you know they can move around for hours, uh, unlike the robots that we, we can build, uh, where their battery will die pretty quickly. So we could start thinking about systems where we could say control an insect or, um, uh, or, or use, you know, tap into their neural signals and try to use their own sensors, which can be sometimes better than what we can build with electronics to get the best of both worlds. Vikram, thanks for speaking to us. Yeah, thanks so much. It was great talking to you. Bye. And we're going to move on now to Test 24. This week on the set of Test 24, we have an instrument that resembles a harp and that performs like a speaker. It's made out of wood and it promises quality natural sounds thanks to a physics phenomenon. Dan, tell us more about it. 
Well, before I go into that uh, physics phenomenon, let's just listen into how this uh, instrument sounds. The quality of the music is beautiful. It's, it's quite sharp. Very sound, sharp right? Well, the property that it uses, it's called resonance. So every object has its own natural frequency. So in this case, it's made of spruce wood. So spruce wood have its uh, set of frequency at which it will vibrate. Uh, plastic has its own frequency. Different materials have different frequencies. Now using this property, the creators of owned that's the name of this instrument, they have um, used transducers inside this, uh, inside this device. So what happens is that the audio signal, the input audio signal is converted into uh, electrical sig an electrical signal thanks to transducers and this electrical signal then powers a magnet that vibrates at a natural frequency which is similar to that of the wood and that's how the wood starts vibra vibrating and you start hearing the sound. Now this acts uh, in the range of 50 hertz to 18 kilohertz which is the na natural frequency at which you can hear the sound. Now the wood is also very special it's made uh, it's, a, it's spruce wood which has been um, which is from the Jura Mountains and very specific region of the Jura Mountains. And as you can see, there are, um, I think, three or four holes. Those are also linked to the way we hear the sound. So if you want to change the tuning of the sound, you can manipulate it by creating uh, more holes or you can, you know, have less holes. So there's a lot of engineering involved. There's a lot of And the physics. device itself is beautiful. And it's, it's an absolutely beautiful device. Yes. Thank you, Dan and Jake Hadelkar. That brings us to the end of this week's edition of Tech24. We hope you enjoyed it and do stay with us here on France 24.